The world speaks to each of us in different ways. For some, it comes through music and song, and for others, it comes through movement and dance. And for me, it came through computer science and applied mathematics. I just understood it through the languages of COBOL and FORTRAN and assembler code, and I just got how the computers worked. I love those computers, <laughs> a little too much. I fell in love with them, and that made me a little uncomfortable. So I decided that when I was an undergraduate, I was going to take just as many courses in philosophy and Eastern ways of knowing as I could. And that made me feel a lot better. And when I graduated, my career took off. My first job was as a systems engineer, and I developed one of the first precursors to what you know today as our modern day GPS systems. Then I moved into management, and eventually I became the president and chief operating officer of an e-business software and consulting business on Wall Street. Basically, I kicked butt for 18 years. <laughs> but in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I felt a shift. Something was changing. All this technology had come on the scene. The media and the press were just so excited, and technology would make us more efficient, more productive, more everything. And it was really cool. And it was true. It did all those things. But I also noticed when I walk into my office that people were not really treating each other all that well. As a matter of fact, I thought they were treating each other a little more dysfunctionally than they were 10 years prior. And I couldn't understand what was going on, but I definitely sensed that something was happening below the surface, kind of an unintended consequence of all this technology. So I decided to leave and go back to get my PhD. And the reason I wanted to go back and get my PhD was because I wanted to find out if something was happening, how we could maximize the technology better, but also make people feel better in their jobs. So I got my PhD in technology management. And in 2006, my PhD won Best PhD of the Year Award. And what I had discovered was something called virtual distance. And basically what virtual distance is, it's what we lose when the human being is translated through the machine. And I was able to go back to corporate America and quantitatively demonstrate that when virtual distance was high, it affected things they cared about, things like innovation and performance. And I was also able to show them that when you reduced virtual distance, you got better results on critical success factors, and you also could make people feel better. But then I started to realize it wasn't just in business. People from all walks of life started to talk to me, parents, teachers, even policymakers. And I was invited to speak at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum and the Stockholm School of Economics. And I began to realize there was a bigger picture going on. There was something much bigger happening that I hadn't realized. And I began to wonder, where do I stand in all of this? Where do people like me stand in all of this? People whose developmental years happened at a time when we didn't have all of this technology. But as an adult, we were surrounded by it. And I decided it was different. And I decided to name us the threshold generation. The threshold generation is a group of people who know the difference between a life lived with and without all of this technology. Our generation will be the last generation on Earth to readily know the difference between real and virtual things. And when we're gone, our children are not going to know what they don't know. Recently, a friend of mine bought his three-year-old an iPad, and she loves playing with that iPad, as all kids do. And one day, he noticed her walking up to some sliding glass doors in their kitchen. And she walked up to it, and there was a spider on the other side of the glass. And she went up to it, and she put her fingers on the glass, and she started to do this. Some people say that this is an old story. Socrates was very upset when writing came into being because he thought people would forget and lose touch with the human condition. Others got worried when the radio came out because they thought it would be too much of a distraction. And others got very nervous when the TV came out in the 50s and 60s because they thought that we'd become a group of stupid idiots. 
<laughs> but things are different now. You couldn't carry the TV with you wherever you went. And you never thought that the TV was talking to you. You never thought that it was sending you messages. Because if you did, the men in white coats would come and get you and put you in an institution and they would fill you with heavy doses of drugs to quell these psychotic episodes. But today, our devices really do talk to us, literally. They do send us messages, and not just any messages. They send us messages that are custom designed for us and us alone. For the first time in human history, our devices can become proxies for real human relationships. They can become stand-ins for personhood. And as I'm talking to you today, there are coders working very hard all over the world to make sure that these delusions seem more and more real. And it's getting us very confused about what the computer can and cannot do. Basically, all a computer is is a metal container, okay? And inside of it is some wires and some other circuitry. And all the computer can actually do is detect an electrical signal. And when that signal gets passed through the computer, the only thing the box can do is add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That's it. That's all it can do. Now, when you string a lot of these boxes together and you throw a lot of processing power and memory and disk drive at them, they can compute some amazing things. They can sequence DNA, and they can render movies like Avatar. But at the end of the day, they can't learn anything. They can't teach us anything, because they don't know anything. It's just a box. The emperor has no clothes. And yet, we think, we all think, that our friends live in that box. We feel that even a piece of us lives in that box, and we talk to that box, and that box talks back to us. But in reality, what we're all doing is just talking to ourselves all day. We're basically roaming around in a hall of mirrors. And this is pe making people all over the world feel very uneasy. Because human beings don't like it when they're in a box. It makes them feel very uncomfortable because we're starting to get lost in transmission. So, what do we do about this? What do we do to fix all of this? Well, first we have to understand that the human being feels well. We are well because of our direct experiences with the world itself. We feel like we come alive through all of our senses when we can feel and touch and see and smell the world in all of its wonder wonderful glory. It comes to us and it makes us feel whole and complete and we're integrated through our mind and our body and our soul. We feel whole. We feel put together, and it weaves an amazing, beautiful tapestry that is what becomes of us as a human being. But some people will continue to tell us or treat us as though we're just a brain on a stick. But we're not. As a matter of fact, when we were born, we were already having a perfect conversation with our world. So how do we fix this? How do we get through this disconnect? The first thing we have to do is to remember that we are not a bunch of addicts. One of the most disturbing days of my life was when I heard that the DSM-5 was going to put an internet or technology addiction in there. The DSM-5 is a big fat book that doctors and psychiatrists and therapists use to look up diagnoses codes for mental illness. But you can't treat an addict without taking away the substance it is that they're abusing. You can't treat an alcoholic by not taking away his bottle. That's how you treat them. And if you want that alcoholic to stay healthy for the rest of his life, that alcoholic can never, ever, ever touch that bottle again. 
But we can't do that with computers or our devices. We need them. We live in a modern world, and they're very useful to us in many ways. So that's, that's not what we can do. As a matter of fact, the American Association of Pediatrics recently sort of pulled back on the number of hours they're recommending that kids can spend in front of a screen because they said, and I quote, we have to acknowledge that the real world contains these devices. But what they didn't say, what no one ever says, is that these devices do not contain the real world. We have to stop thinking about this in terms of taking things away, and we have to start thinking about it in terms of putting ourselves back. And the way we do that is to look at another question, which is this issue of balance, right? So we think everything can be balanced. We can balance the technology with our lives. We can balance our work. We can balance our lives. We can balance the technology. But that's a big problem because balance assumes that the technology holds the same authoritative stance as the human being. That somehow spending time with the technology is the equivalent of spending time with the, tech, with the human. But that's just not true. It's not about balance. It's about meaning. What does that box mean to you? Because if that box doesn't really hold a lot of meaning, it doesn't matter if we spend five minutes or five hours or five days on the box. We can put it down and we can go back to our lives and do what, what is to us meaningful. But if we give that box too much meaning, if it holds too high a priority in our life, that's when we have to be careful. So there are two things that we can remember to work with this. Number one, that device doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about me. It doesn't care about anybody. And more importantly, that box does not care about what it leaves to our children. We care what we leave to our children. And the threshold generation has something very special. We have a line of sight that no one else has ever had. We can see in between the before and the after. And we know what it is that makes us well as human beings, like empathy, for example. But we know that empathy is on the decline. Recent research says when they studied 14,000 students, they found that over 75% of them had less empathy than students had 30 years ago. And they found that most of that drop-off has come in the past 10 years. And they found causal evidence in that study to show that technology had a huge influence on that. Now, as troubling as it might seem, we don't understand empathy very well, actually, because empathy as an adult, we grow into empathy as a way to be able to put ourselves into someone else's shoes. That's basically what it means. But what most people don't understand is that before we can get to that part of our growth in empathy, we actually have to develop something more fundamental, and that's called theory of mind. Theory of mind is something that develops that allows us to understand that people have minds of their own, that they think differently than we do, that they feel differently than we do. And theory of mind develops when we're very young, between about the ages of three to five. And researchers test for theory of mind by doing what I call the candy box test. So they sit a little kid down at a table and they take out like a box of M&Ms and they shake the box and they ask the kid, what's in the box? And the, bo and the kid says, candy's in the box. And they say, that's right. And then they open the box and they pour out the candy and they replace it with a bunch of pebbles. And they close the box and they shake the box and they ask, okay, what's in the box now? And the child says, pebbles are in the box. And the researcher says, that's right. And then the researcher says, what if someone were to walk in right now and didn't know that we switched the candies for the pebbles, but I just shook the box and showed them, what do you think they will think is in the box? And if the child says that they'll think that pebbles are in the box, they have not yet developed theory of mind. They don't yet quite understand that people have minds of their own and that the world does not revolve around them. So let's think back to our three-year-old at the glass door with the spider. When she was doing this, zooming in on the spider, she didn't realize that that spider had a mind of its own, had a will of its own. But we know that empathy is on the decline, and that is worrisome. But what worries me more 
is what we don't know. What else is that box doing to us? We don't really know, and that's where the Threshold Generation Project comes in, because we have to figure this out, and we have to figure it out fast, because boxes are being shipped all over the world very quickly as we speak. But in order to turn our suspicions into science, we have to collect a lot of data because we need to see the data in order to find patterns that we can recognize. And here's where the box becomes very useful to us because we can go out to hundreds or thousands or even millions of people and collect lots of narratives from the threshold generation about the before and after. And we can start finding those patterns and we can start understanding what it is about our human nature that we really need to preserve and what is it about our human nature that we can dare to do without as we enter into a brave new world? We can do this scientifically, too. We can ask questions in a certain way that will give us scientific results. So, for example, I often ask people as a kid, how did you know it was time to come home for dinner? And most people will say to me, well, it started to get dark, or I heard my mother calling from the window, or the lights on the street would start to come up. Another question I ask people is, as a kid, do you remember what a crayon tasted like? <laughs> right? It always brings a smile, laughter. It always brings this amazing sense of joy, no matter what. Just remembering that experience and all that came with it. But when I ask adults today, how do they know when it's time to come home for dinner? They kind of look at me and they say, well, I don't really know because I'm working all the time. <laughs> My boss expects me, me to be on the computer all the time, and I'm just working, working, working. And when I do go home, and I get home for dinner, I have dinner, but then I get back to work. They don't really understand what the question actually means, or what, how to really answer it. We are the threshold generation. We are the last generation in 100,000 years of human beings that will readily be able to know the difference between real and virtual things. We know because of our original human experience, because of our direct experience with the world through all of our glorious senses, that this is what gifts us with things like joy and love and compassion. And we know that it is in these relationships, it is in these experiences, that we will be able to teach back to our children what it means to truly be human. Thank you. <laughs>